In a time of increasing inequality in our country and in our community, there has been a lot of talk about how to address the lack of economic mobility faced by people born into poor households. You heard from John, and there are task forces and commissions working locally, nationally, all over the country trying to address the root causes of this complicated issue. And economic mobility is a complicated issue. It's going to require a variety of solutions that address the various ways that people who are rich or middle income are segregated from those who are poor. You often hear about this issue in schools, but that's not the only place it's happening. We have neighborhoods with little or no racial or economic diversity. People's places of employment. As a result, grocery stores, retail environments, we have fewer and fewer opportunities to engage with people who bring home different paychecks than we do. And this lack of a normal, everyday interaction leads to an unhealthy friction. Because it is hard to consider people or lifestyles that you have no experience with, and it's really easy to ignore problems that don't seem to affect you personally. Believe it or not, though, I'm not here today to talk to you about economic mobility. I've been invited here today to talk to you about transportation. But I fundamentally believe that transportation has the power to transform communities. Transportation can make our communities cleaner, healthier, safer, and yes, I believe transportation can make our communities more equitable too. I'd like to start off by telling you about my car, Violet. You'll often see me driving Violet, shuffling my kids to activities, driving between meetings, headed to the great outdoors on the weekends. Like most Americans, I like my car. And don't tell Violet, but she's actually just the latest in a long line of cars that have had names and personalities and have been the source of many fond memories over the years. But I find that on the days I leave dear Violet parked in my driveway and I walk or I bike or I use transit, I see people, I interact with folks, and I engage. And even if I don't have an opportunity to speak much to my fellow bus passengers, I smile, I wave, I nod, and I see the young mother who's taking her two-year-old and her newborn with a stroller and a diaper bag onto a cat's bus to ride it for a couple of miles to get off the bus at a daycare facility, to presumably turn right back around and return to that bus stop and wait 30 minutes for the next bus to arrive to get to her job across town. Something about seeing her impacts me. The same holds true when we ride our bikes. You're in a mode that's more connected to the environment around you. Plus, the streets that are best for biking are not usually the same that are best for driving. So when you bike, you traverse different streets. You traverse different neighborhoods. You engage and connect in different places. National research tells us that cyclists spend more money supporting their neighborhood businesses than car drivers do. It's not because they have more money, but it's because they're moving a little more slowly, they're in a mode that's more connected, and maybe also because they're a little tired or thirsty. We certainly engage most with people when we're out for a walk. This was really driven home to me recently when my seven-year-old daughter volunteered to babysit for a friend's guinea pig. It had been a rainy day, and was finally a nice evening. I looked up her friend's address. She lived less than a mile from us, and I decided that we should walk there to get the guinea pig. And though there was a time or two on the walk home, as my husband and I are awkwardly carrying a much larger than anticipated guinea pig cage with a tiny, terrified guinea pig in the middle, and I wondered if perhaps the car would have been a better choice, I'm really glad we walked. Because after seven years of living in the same house, on our walk home, we met a neighbor we had never met before. And I'm pretty sure she's always going to remember us with our guinea pig cage. <laughs> I'd like to tell you about my friend Tim. My friend Tim lives less than two miles away from his office. 
He purposely chose an office that's close to home. And he has a variety of options to get there. He's well served by a network of sidewalks, by a bike lane, by a bus route that more or less takes him from home to work. So he'd get exercise. If he rode his bike, he'd burn almost 100 calories. If he walked, almost 200 calories. And while it would take him a few minutes longer, think of how many people he'd be able to engage with. What if he was on the bus? It would cost him a couple of bucks, but he would still burn calories walking back and forth to the bus stop. And he'd engage with 20 or 30 bus passengers each way. But my friend Tim, who knows that biking and walking and using transit are healthier for him and healthier for his community, and he really cares about these issues, my friend Tim drives alone to work each and every day. We can't blame him, can we? We have created an environment where gas is cheap, free parking is abundant, and cars are the undisputed kings and queens of our road. And that shouldn't surprise you, this is how we spend our transportation dollars. Almost 80% of our transportation dollars are designed to help vehicles get around. Bicyclists, pedestrian projects, transit projects, that's all left to compete for the crumbs. So what's the outcome when you invest so heavily in vehicle transportation? Well, people have to walk in environments like this. There are cyclists contending in places like this. And all across the country, there are people waiting for the bus in places like this. So what's the result of a built environment that's so hostile to pedestrians, to cyclists, to transit riders? Well, Tim's not alone. Nationally, 76% of us drive alone to work every day. When you tack on the people who are carpooling, 86% of us are driving by ourselves or driving in a car. You add on those lucky people who get to work from home in their pajamas, and there's only a tiny fraction of the population that's walking or biking or using transit to get to work. And the impact of this to our cultural fabric is staggering. Think about it. When everyone who has access to a car, which is most everyone except for the poorest and the most urban dwellers, when we use our cars for almost all of our trips, which many of us, myself included, are guilty of, then we're missing out on this opportunity each and every day to engage, to connect, to interact with others. And instead of doing that, we're driving alone in a steel bubble. We're engaging with no one. We're seeing nothing. And we're listening only to those things we want to hear whether that's music we already know we like, or talk radio that reinforces our own worldview. And like I said at the beginning, this lack of interaction is what's driving us into generational poverty. Think of our manners when we drive our cars. Think of how you behave, or how someone else behaves, if you get cut off on the highway. You would never act like that if somebody walked in front of you on a sidewalk. Think about the litter on the side of the road. Could you imagine being in a park, walking through, watching someone walk towards you, waiting till they're right about here and then dropping some trash on the ground? No, we would never do that. But in our cars, we feel anonymous. And everyone around us is nameless and faceless too. But this emphasis on driving, on automobile traffic and automobile trips, it's not just problematic because we're missing out on these opportunities to engage with one another. It's problematic because it's not accessible to everyone. Try to save up the money for a car when you're working for minimum wage and supporting a family. Try to get a car loan if you have no credit. And it's not just the poor. Think about the elderly or the disabled or children. In many cases, if you can't access a car, you can't access healthier food. 
job opportunities, educational opportunities, countless opportunities are passing you by because you can't get there in an automobile. If we're sincere in our interest to overcome the death of the American dream, which is happening right now on our watch, and if we truly want children born into poor households to have the exact same opportunities that our kids have, well, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that a more balanced transportation system is some sort of silver bullet, because it's not. But I will say this. The current auto-centric world we live in, it's part of the problem. And it's perpetuating generational poverty. I know I said I wasn't coming here today to talk to you about economic mobility, and at this point in the, my presentation, I'm starting to feel a little disingenuous. But here's the thing. I started out in transportation because I thought that a balanced transportation system would lead to a more environmentally sustainable place. I really believed it was the more economically sustainable decision. And I knew that there would be social benefits as well. But after all these years of working in transportation, I've come to feel very strongly that it really just comes down to this. It's not fair to continue to heavily subsidize a mode of transportation that's not accessible to everyone. That is not who we are. We cannot continue to accept single-use suburban development that's totally car-oriented when we all know that it merits that place essentially inaccessible to the poor. That's not who we are. Cars have their place. It's just that it can't be the only place. We have to think about cyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders first and prioritize their comfort. We also have to stop pretending that this is some grand coincidence, or that this is really just a reflection of our preferences. What this is, is a transportation system working exactly as it's been designed. You see, in 1956, President Eisenhower passed a landmark piece of legislation. It was called the Federal Aid Highway Act, and it created our interstate highway system and countless economic opportunities have come to our country as a result. People and goods can travel quickly and easily between cities, across state lines, across the country. But the problem is, we all stand here, or sit, 60 years later, and despite decades of rapid urbanization, we are still funding our transportation network in the very same way. The vision continues to be one where we fund automobile trips on highways and we fail to pay attention to what's happening inside the cities where people can engage and interact and commerce can happen, which is the very reason that cities were created in the first place. There is good news, though, and I'm happy to tell you about it. After decades of more and more people driving for more and more of their trips, watching more vehicle miles on more vehicles across the country, that tide has finally started to change. The tide has started to turn. People are now riding transit in record-breaking numbers, walking and biking for most of their trips. Millennials are waiting longer to get their driver's licenses, they're not buying cars in the same numbers that previous generations did. And most importantly, people are starting to choose where to live based on places that provide this balance of options where you have many different choices for getting around. Additionally, there's a whole sharing economy that's emerging in transportation with services like Uber, Lyft, with car sharing, with relay rides and get around, there are more and more ways for people who didn't have access to a car to get access to one when they need it. Plus, these introduce the opportunities for people to engage and interact while they're getting around in a car. But if you're like me, or like my friend Tim, this is all really exciting, and yet we still really like our cars. So what can we do? 
I have four things for all of us. First, we can ride transit. Maybe not every day, maybe not for every trip, but we could each find a way to incorporate transit trips. What if everyone in this room agreed to ride transit once a week? Think of the impact that would have. For those of you who already ride transit, great. Please get your friends and neighbors to ride transit too. We can bike or we can walk, not just for exercise or recreation, but to get somewhere. We can all find a way to replace some short car trip with a walk or a bike ride. Maybe not to get a guinea pig, but for another. We can eat educate ourselves further about these issues, and we can elect policymakers that will prioritize them, and then we need to hold them accountable. This needs to happen at all levels of government. And finally, each and every one of us can find a way to shake up our everyday patterns and find ways to engage with the people who need our help most in this community and provide a hand up and an opportunity. John gave us some great ideas, didn't he? We can coach, we can volunteer, we can mentor, and we don't have to travel far to do it. So once we've all found this place where we can plug in to help people who were born into poverty in our community, maybe we could ride the bus to get there, or we could ride our bikes. Thank you so much.